morning, everyone, and welcome to the Delphi Economic Forum and to this panel on the quest for the strategic autonomy of Europe. I am uh, Giorgio Leali, I'm a reporter for Political Europe, and I'm joined today by Johan Borgstam, ambassador of Sweden to the Atlantic Republic, Marcus Ferber, a member of the European Parliament from the European uh, People's Party, uh, Rosa Balfour, director of Carnegie Europe, a foreign policy expert, and Ivana Dragicevic, who is a journalist and also a fellow at the Institute for Human Science. So thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Today we will discuss a very, uh, a very complex topic, the one of strategic autonomy. It's an expression that we have heard a lot, especially uh, over the past uh, couple of years, but it's a very hard to define concept. If we would ask to the Oracle of Delphi what strategic autonomy <laughs> is, we would get probably a very enigmatic answer. Maybe the answer would be know yourself. So we could maybe <laughs> see this question as the question for Europe on what Europe really is. So depending on the answer that you give to the real meaning of strategic autonomy of Europe, you also find out what is your vision of what Europe uh, could be. But we will explore these uh, questions with our, with our speakers and we will focus mm -hmm. our discussion on two main, main pillars. The first one, will be from an economic point of view. We will ask ourselves what is strategic autonomy when it comes to trade, when it comes to industrial policy, when it comes sometimes maybe even to protectionism. And then in the second part of our conversation, we will look at it for more from a defense point of view, from a foreign policy point of view, and we will see whether Russia's invasion of Ukraine has changed the role of the European Union and has transformed it into something, into something different. So, Let's start, yeah. and of course, uh, if you have questions after, feel free to, to ask them, and also to the speakers, feel free to intervene and comment on what other speakers have said so far. I would like to start with you, Mr. Ferber, and ask you from the perspective of the European Parliament whether you see that there has been a shift in the role of the European Union when it comes to industrial policy, and whether you think that the, the free trade DNA and the role, the traditional role of the European Union has changed. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, and you touched already the points very properly, and uh, I think the oracle would say whatever you do at the end, it will be wrong, and <laughs> that's my main concern. That's why we should uh, try to understand what we really mean by autonomy, or strategic autonomy, autonomous on what? And that means, to translate it uh, in another way, uh, we celebrated at the beginning of this year 30 years of single market in the European Union, but honestly, for the moment, I don't see developments in the single market. I see even step backs with new bureaucratic procedures inside the European Union. So number one for me to achieve a kind of strategic autonomy means strengthening the single market as the cornerstone of our economical uh, uh, behavior. On the other hand, one of the promises of the European Commission in 2019 was with the Green Deal, of course, we will have a shift from old industries to new industries, and uh, this shift is now challenged, for example, by the Inflation Reduction Act of the United States, which uh, tried to attract investments to the United States in that areas where we thought new jobs will be created inside the European Union, and we have to be aware of that. And certainly, in instruments like uh, the CBAM, uh, we are introducing new hurdles um, in, in, in trade policies which are not 100% uh, linked to uh, WTO standards. And we have to be aware that that can be used against us as well. So if we discuss strategic autonomy, to translate it uh, in another way, we should concentrate what really has to be done inside European Union. It's not for fate that a lot of production left us. If I take, for example, what we learned during COVID in the healthcare system, in the pharmaceuticals production, uh, that was for some good reasons that some uh, productions left European Union, but now we have to think to come back. I worked up, uh, by myself uh, 30 years ago in the chips industry, <laughs> semiconductor devices. Uh, 30 years ago, Germany spent a lot of money to attract companies to invest in Germany. If I look now what we have 30 years later, it's almost nothing. All the things have disappeared again, and now we try to attract it again. Wow, <laughs> we could have done that even before. And uh, therefore, we really have to rethink what are our partners we should and we can cooperate together. And of course, uh, their transatlantic is important. I would uh, prefer uh, to have 
better uh, alignments, for example, with the Mercosur, with Latin America. I think Africa in our neighborhood has a huge possibility to develop, and we are dependent from them in a lot of uh, raw materials and resources. So we should concentrate on that as well, because for the moment we see that China is very active in the African continent to have access to these resources without asking whether that is a stable democracy, whether all human rights, uh, labor rights uh, are enforced or not. Uh, so we could deliver something more there, and that could create an environment where we are not dependent from one region, and that is, I think, what we have to achieve. Thank in short you. words. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned already one aspect that I think is particularly interesting and I would like to maybe hear all of you on it, some kind of step back in the, in the internal market. So just to remind you, to people who are listening to us what we're talking about, we have seen, especially in the past months, some evolutions in the European industrial policy. One of those evolutions has been a relaxation of uh, anti-subsidy rules of the state aid regime. Other evolutions are also related to trade defense measures and also some green measures that could have some uh, trade defense aspects and the carbon border adjustment mechanism could be seen as, a, as one of those. So the, the question they would maybe ask to you, uh, Jonas Borgstam, do you see uh, a risk that uh, uh, there could be some kind of betrayal of some free trade values and do you see a risk of fragmentation of the European single market if those rules are further relaxed? Well, uh, thanks, uh, Emilian. Uh, Giorgio, and first of all, since I've always found the concept of European strategic autonomy uh, rather confusing, I really like your idea of giving the future uh, a chance to uh, enlighten us uh, on that. I, I think we have to be very clear about one thing, and that is that the main challenge to uh, European uh, competitiveness uh, is not the uh, American uh, IRA is not the protectionist policies of the China or uh, other global powers. It's uh, very much in what um, Marcus uh, already alluded to. We, we tend to forget what an amazing uh, achievement the single European, um, uh, the internal market is, incidentally, celebrating uh, 30 years. Uh, this year, uh, amazing things were uh, achieved, uh, not uh, least when it comes to goods, but uh, there are big steps needed to bring it further when it comes to uh, developing uh, the internal market, when it comes to services, when it comes to developing the internal market, uh, when it comes to uh, digital uh, business uh, models. And um, if we, uh, if European companies are to uh, produce the energy, uh, make the batteries, the electric cars, the fossil uh, free steel of the future, well, then they need the, the proper conditions to, uh, to compete. So we very much come back to how the internal market uh, functions, uh, securing um, a strong focus on the long-term competitiveness of uh, Europe of uh, European uh, companies. Um, so uh, rather than uh, fantasizing about entering <coughs> into a, a, a spiral in relation to, uh, for, for example, the, the United States in trying to uh, out-subsidize uh, the industries by, by raising barriers of uh, our own, we, we should look uh, at the real reasons why uh, Europe, uh, in certain respects, uh, is lagging behind, such as low levels of uh, productivity, low levels of uh, investments in uh, research and uh, development. Thank you very much. So we've seen, I mean, that this concept of strategic autonomy, when it comes to the economic dimension, uh, really put on the table many questions on the very essence of the European Union and what were the strengths of the European Union and what could be the weaknesses if those strengths are kind of abundant. And I'd like to ask to you, uh, Rosa Balfour, about uh, maybe we can still stay a little bit on this economic point of view and, and to see whether maybe one meaning of strategic autonomy of Europe would it mean uh, for Europe to become a superpower, a bloc like the United States and China when it comes to the economy, then we will move to defense. Is that a right way of framing things or do you see things differently? 
Um, thank you very much. Um, and let me just congratulate you on the oracle, know yourself. I think that's a brilliant definition of what the quest for strategic um, autonomy ought to look like. Um, I'll get to your uh, point in a moment, but let me perhaps just add something. I think this came out very vividly with the Brexit negotiations. Yeah. And actually, there was a sort of discovery of what the European Union is about and what member states are willing to fight for, and that is the single market. Um, so, you know, that clearly is the common basis that everyone shares. It is a debated space, how much protectionism, how much free market, et cetera, et cetera. But that is, that is the landing place for all the EU member states and the institutions, and that's where the EU has built its strength. Now, if you look at this internationally, the single market was built at a time of uh, globalization. Some call it hyper-globalization or neoliberalism, and the EU has done very well in that space. Um, and it has created a system whereby European prosperity is very much tied to interdependence. And now, of course, that we have had global shocks to globalization, that there's a debate on deglobalization, decoupling, uh, regionalization of trade, et cetera, et cetera, the EU needs to find where it fits. And that has an internal dimension, which is, you know, upgrading the single market, making Europe fit for the 21st century from the point of view of technology and, of course, um, um, the environment and fighting the climate crisis. But it also has an international dimension. And so I think you rightly asked the question, does that mean, are these changes going to affect the rules around which the EU managed to do so well over the past 50 years. So I think that's, that's an appropriate question, but I also think we don't know where the landing place will be in that respect. Um, is, can the EU be a third power? I mean, the, the EU is a third bloc, um, and I think that is, um, that is uh, something we do not need to contest. The question is whether it has the capacity and whether it is in its interest to position itself as a third power in the sense uh, that Macron intended um, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago after his trip to, um, to China. And I think there's a little bit of wishful thinking in this sense. Um, you know, we've talked about strategic autonomy actually comes from security and defense, and it is interpreted, in my, in my, my view, wrongly, but that's how it is commonly interpreted in a relational dimension, i.e., what does it mean with respect to the United States? Well, what we're seeing is that the more Europeans talk about strategic autonomy, the more de facto, actually, the connection and the, the relationship with the United States is critical, also on security and defense. So, so to imagine that Europe can be a third bloc, you know, detached from these in, um, international relationships, I think is a little bit, um, is, is a bit misplaced. Uh, this doesn't mean that the EU should not build upon what its strengths are, and it doesn't mean that the EU should not be able to define autonomously what its objectives are on the international arena, what its preferences are, who it talks to, and about what. Um, so so without, you know, without questioning the, the sort of political uh, desire to, for Europe to play a role uh, internationally, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was going to be a third power um, in the sense that Macron intended. Thank you very much. I, I find particularly interesting what you were saying about the relational dimension of the definition of strategic autonomy, because on one hand, of course, we see that this, the relation with the United States becomes more and more strategic in the actual context, but then there are some fields in which there is maybe really uh, competing interest between, uh, between the different blocks, if we consider the EU as one. And I was thinking, for example, as raw materials, and when it comes to rare earth, there are essential for, uh, for the future of Europe, for the future of the world more in general, as they are used in key technologies. So I wanted to ask you, Ivana Dorjicevic, what do you see uh, this as a potential conflict, a potential file of tensions, and how can Europe, being uh, autonomous strategically, even in this field, knowing that it doesn't have those raw materials in the continent? Thank you for this question, and I will add something to it, because I also think that I'm not Greek, but I hope I pronounce it right, gnotis euton, or know yourself, is of utmost importance for us as a continent. We can talk about strategic autonomy, but we can also frame it like how Europe can be safe and resilient in challenges ahead. Uh, what you've mentioned, uh, rare earth, raw materials, uh, it's of 
utmost strategic importance what von der Leyen said in her State of the Union speech uh, last year, not to be dependent again as we were on uh, gas and oil. So we know that China is the biggest, how to say, owner of, of these materials. But we saw a very interesting development, uh, I think it was last week in Chile, what uh, their president Gabriel Boric uh, Fond did, not because he's of Croatian origin as I am, but it's an interesting concept because I think Chile has the second largest reserves of lithium. And what he did was not, as uh, international media put, uh, uh, nationalization of resources, but he basically constructed some kind of private state partnership. It will depend what will be the political outcome within Chile of that. That is always a risk in countries like that. But I think uh, uh, Europe understands what its needs are, and she will need to, what Rosa rightly put, strategize more in forming new kind of partnership. I think it's very indicative that Xi Jinping yesterday called Zelensky. Mm -hmm. We'll see what will be uh, uh, the end of it. And uh, talking about knowing ourselves in this fight, not just rare earth, raw materials, finding our safety net and our resilient place in our 2050 strategy becoming uh, a climate neutral continent, we need to think uh, as, uh, for, about us as a continent that can be still a place of safeguarding liberal values, because we see weaponization of values. Uh, we see the penetration of Russia and other malign actors in the last decade, you know, through cyber, hybrid means. Europe doesn't still have a common political space. We don't have the same language. So they can play out in regional and national uh, uh, arenas. And I think uh, to, to, to have uh, European Google, European Meta, something like that, I think that is of our strategic importance uh, for our future at the moment. And we need to focus, we now hear words dismantling disinformation, media literacy, talking about strategic autonomy. We need to focus as our strategic autonomy goal in education of our youth, because we see the trend in Europe youth not voting. We are demographically doomed, you know, doubtful continent who will be 4% of world population in the next 50 years. We have 1 billion under 35s in our south, in Africa. So it's not strange that von der Leyen's commission put democracy, demography, and European values as separate parts in this commission. And I think this is also something beside raw materials, energy, economy, that we need to think of ourselves uh, to be democracy guardians, it may be too harsh word, but this is also one part of our strategic economy for the future because people can visit Delphi, but there will be no one living in Delphi anymore. So that is also our strategic resilience slash safety security uh, uh, way for, our, for Europe. Thank you very much. I mean, it's very interesting. I think each speaker highlighted some elements that are part of this definition. And of course, we tend to always think at strategic autonomy from an economic and uh, defense point of view. But it goes, it's something a lot, a lot wider, of course. And there are other aspects that has to be uh, considered. And I'd like just to come back to what was said before about the comments made by, by the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who said uh, in an interview with Politico, by the way, that uh, Europe should not be a follower of, of the United States and of other powers. He was referring to a specific point, which is the situation of Taiwan, but indeed this comment kind of opened a uh, lot of reflections on more in general what is the, the place of, of Europe on, uh, on the global stage. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning before also uh, Chile as, as, a, as a strategic country when it comes to its raw materials, and it's interesting how the EU is trying to uh, create an influence strategy as well on some strategic countries. There was last week uh, this strategy that was discussed by, by foreign affairs ministers to increase influence in four, uh, in four strategic countries, Brazil, Chile, Nigeria, and Kazakhstan, precisely because there are very important uh, energy sources or raw materials in those, uh, in those countries. 
if okay for you, we might maybe move to the defense part of the discussion and maybe just see what it means. I mean, you already mentioned it somehow, what it means uh, strategic autonomy when it comes to uh, the military aspect of things and how Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine has uh, changed totally the situation. Uh, of course, it's not, I mean, the main question is really, in this case, maybe strategic autonomy from the United States and from, uh, from NATO. So I would like to ask all of you about, about this. And maybe I would like to start, uh, to start with you, Joan Borgston, because your country has, uh, has gone through something that we would call a, a shift. I don't know if you would use that word. And I would like to understand better how do you, how do you think that the war in Ukraine has changed Sweden's attitude towards uh, the transatlantic alliance? Yeah, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Giorgio, just uh, on the topic of uh, strategic uh, autonomy and as it was put in the panel, uh, autonomy from uh, what? The starting point for Sweden uh, when it comes to uh, defense uh, is safeguarding a strong uh, transatlantic uh, link. I mean, let's make no bones about that. The United States is and will remain uh, crucial to, uh, to, for European security. That's been uh, amply demonstrated uh, by the uh, aftermath of the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. When it comes to uh, Sweden more specifically and the decision to uh, apply for membership of NATO, uh, there was broad consensus uh, in the Swedish parliament that the uh, deterioration of the European security environment caused by the brutal uh, Russian uh, invasion, it's uh, structural uh, and it's long term. And uh, this uh, is also to be seen in the light of, of uh, the fundamental changes that we've been witnessing in uh, Russian uh, society, Russian uh, political realities, and th there also uh, is very clear that it's a new uh, Russia uh, that has uh, emerged. We, are, we have to uh, relate and live to that. Uh, for Sweden, uh, the, the Russian uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine also highlighted the boundaries of um, being um, uh, a partner of uh, NATO. Uh, let, let's remember that uh, Ukraine and NATO uh, are both so-called uh, enhanced opportunities partners. And um, well, the collective defense of NATO does not include a partner uh, dimension. Uh, Article 5 has always been intended uh, to, uh, to defend uh, allies uh, only. Uh, and Russia has never attacked uh, a NATO member. And we, I mean, there, there is also uh, close to a consensus uh, in Sweden that NATO membership will uh, actually raise the threshold for uh, military conflict. Uh, Swedish and also Finnish membership uh, of NATO will, in that sense, have a deterrent effect in northern Europe, because uh, obviously with both Sweden and uh, Finland as NATO members, all Nordic uh, and all Baltic countries uh, will be uh, covered by collective defense guarantees. And uh, the current uncertainty in the, the, the northern uh, region of Europe, given the different uh, statuses, so, so to speak, of the different uh, countries in relation to uh, NATO uh, will create uh, certain uncertainty and that, that will obviously decrease with Sweden and Finland uh, uh, joining the alliance. Thank you. And Rosamund Kure, I'd like to ask you, since you mentioned before a little bit this paradox, on one hand we have the quest for strategic autonomy, but then on the other end we see that partnership and strategic partnerships are more important than ever. So how do you, do you think that NATO, for example, mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, again, to quote President Macron, he said that NATO was uh, kind of, uh, I think that the expression he used was brain dead, but in any case was in a very bad situation. Do you think that things have changed and that precisely this very uh, peculiar situation which we're in proved that 
alliances like this one, they are not in contradiction with strategic autonomy? Yeah, um, let me just, just underline one point, is that any serious discussion in the European Union about strategic autonomy is usually accompanied by in full complementarity with NATO. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the EU doing things outside the, the you know, it's just about complementarity with NATO and the degree to which uh, the European pillar of, of, of NATO is able to carry out operations without, necessarily without, uh, um, without the US. That, that's the debate. Um, every time it is mentioned, it is c contentious in the EU, so it's politically contentious. Um, and I think this, that this will continue. It's not going to get, um, it's not going to change, despite the fact that because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Europeans have, have found a new uh, unity in um, over what is the most, what has been the most divisive foreign policy issue, which is Russia. Um, and now it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, widely um, acknowledged as a threat. Um, the response and the type of response that uh, Europeans, uh, the EU, but also other uh, countries in Europe, um, is inequivocal. Um, and you know, they will continue. They will be, so long as the war continues, will continue to build on that type of unity. Um, sorry, remind me of your question. <laughs> so my question was whether uh, we see kind of a, I mean, you, you, you already answered to that in yeah. part when you mentioned this complementarity between strategic yeah. autonomy and NATO, but I was just wondering whether we are finding in a situation in which NATO is becoming more and more important while yes, just a few years ago. Yes, of course, on NATO. Was... Yeah, I mean, obviously NATO has, uh, uh, I think the, I mean, you know, let's, let's be honest, Macron, I think, uh, intellectually has a lot of ideas, but the diplomatic conveying of these ideas sometimes is controversial. Um, so I think he was being provocative by saying that, but it did trigger a rethink of NATO and the NATO strategic concept. And then of course, Russia invades Ukraine. And there is clearly a new bound role for NATO as Finland's accession and Sweden, we assume soon to be accession, demonstrate. So, and that is very much tied to the original intent of NATO. And I think the drift that perhaps some felt about NATO was where is its relevance in a world that is changing? And then we go back to an old type of war, and so uh, NATO's raison d'etre suddenly becomes um, important. We've also seen, and I think this is really important, and this is also where the European Union can play a bigger role, we've seen uh, a, a deepening of the relationship between the EU and NATO because there are all sorts of areas that are hybrid areas, they're not necessarily traditional um, uh, security and defense, where the EU can play a role. And we also <coughs> see that the EU is doubling down on uh, trying to fireproof um, its democracy, its, um, its economy, its, um, its uh, infrastructure, its uh, access to critical raw materials, its access to the, the keys to you know, future prosperity. Uh, that's what it's doing, and some of it needs to be done in partnership with NATO. Some of it, I hope, will, will be done in partnership with other regional organizations that at the moment are a bit silent. Huh? Think of OSCE or Absolutely. other organizations. Uh, a lot also, of course, with the United Nations. And, you know, when you look at it from the international perspective, of course the, the U.S. is there because, you know, EU, Europe and the US are very close to each other on what those international rules are, which is another reason for which the third block doesn't make sense, because on the, all the big uh, fundamental principles, the EU, Europe, the United States are aligned. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers it. It does, it does, it totally does. And you mentioned another concept that we haven't spoken about yet, but that I find very interesting. It's all this kind of hybrid war, so you, you, mm -hmm. You described the old type of war and the old role of NATO and this kind of new type of, of war, this hybrid uh, threat. So I'd like to ask you, Ivana Dragicevic, about this. How do you see this kind of new war? How is it transforming uh, things as we used to, to look at them? Well, what I already said, I think that Europe unfortunately failed to, in the prevention phase. We now have you know, time to, to maybe uh, uh, find a better position, two countries that are in forefront of that are Sweden and Finland. Because Sweden, I think, is the only European country that has something, it's deterrence mechanism, it's called Swedish Defense Psychological Agency, fantastic people inside. 
and they are dealing with, let's say, outside threats from that side. And in Helsinki, we have not all EU members are inside, but this hybrid uh, countering, let's say, disinformation center, which is which is of very uh, much of uh, importance. But talking about common strategy within EU, I think Commission is in the forefront of it because you have a lot of, uh, let's say, policies there. Uh, but the, the the problem in that regard of Europe is still that you know intelligence is not shared. Uh, that language problem because cyber and hybrid and the info things are being very localized and regionalized and their attack, I don't know, the, the, the campaigns in Sweden are not the same as in Croatia or in Italy as in Greece. So uh, this is something that Europe needs to take care of it. I think I have to uh, load the parliament because you're also becoming more and more relevant and I think strengthening of European democratic institutions uh, in that regard, so to build more, more awareness about what hybrid uh, uh, cyber and disinfo means. Because we remember, I don't know, 2017, 2018 was this biggest Russia's uh, hybrid attack on European soil. We didn't learn much of it. And, you know, Ukraine, in all these years since 2014, 2015, was telling to everyone what's been going on and what they're doing now in the war is showing us that they, they were prepared more than us. So uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, AI, of course, we didn't touch upon that. It's of uh, utmost importance also for the new forms of warfare. So it's very good, you know, that when was it two years ago that you has this, you know, basically first ever legal framework for AI. But then chat GPT showed up and we were kind of shocked that uh, other forms can be made. So uh, a, a lot of things ahead of us, you know, the strategic, um, uh, uh, how do you say, when you're in the front of it, is the, the autocratic systems and surveillance, basically capitalism that is in China, for example, that is, uh, 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 that is the risk uh, for us, so I think the resources needs to be put on that. We have elections in 2024 in Europe, and uh, to, to concentrate on this is going to be very important because uh, how cards will play in European political field next year is also something I'm not that, I'm very cautious about. Natalie, since you mentioned the, the European Parliament and, and the elections, I'd like to ask a question to you, uh, Marcus Ferber, about what was mentioned before on on the kind of new uh, uh, consciousness that the European Union is having on, on its role, and also when it comes to the, to, the defense, to the defense aspect and to the military point of view, we first had just an instrument, the European Peace Facility, but now we see that there are new things that are coming. We see also that uh, the military question is becoming an industrial policy issue as well, with Commissioner Breton proposing to have an industrial plan to produce more, more weapons in Europe, because there again is the concern that many uh, military equipment is produced in the United States. So I was wondering from, the pers from your perspective and the role of the European Parliament, do you see a shift there as well? And do you see some risks associated to it? Because the European Union was born probably with a different type of project in mind, no? Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> I do not want to touch the history. Thank you very much, <laughs> because uh, we started with creating a European Defense Union, which was then in the 50s denied by France itself. Uh, and, and then the single market was invented, the economical integration. And now we come back uh, mm -hmm. to the good old times uh, of the founding members that peace in Europe can only be guaranteed if we are able to protect ourselves. And uh, that is a new challenge we learned. And honestly, and that is what uh, France has to answer as well, as according to the Budapest Memorandum, France is one of the guarantee powers of, the, uh, of Ukraine. So what did Macron deliver? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm not blaming him, but uh, it's not so easy to say in military aspects we should be more autonomous because I sometimes have the feeling, and that is a good French tradition, from the goal over Sarkozy <laughs> till now, um, <clears throat> to leave the NATO, to be powerful France, to enter the NATO again, that was Sarkozy, because they couldn't afford anymore a lot of things. Now asking the European Union to take over 
the nuclear weapons because they cannot finance them anymore. Sorry for being so unpolite. But, but that is the background. And that is not a European strategy, that is a French strategy, which will not help us. Therefore, I fully share what has been said, that uh, our security can only be guaranteed with NATO, not without NATO, that's for sure. And uh, that is what Ukraine is discussing as well, as they had the Budapest Memorandum with Russia, with the United States, with the United Kingdom and France as guarantee powers, and it did not work. So <laughs> NATO membership, EU membership, for them, maybe achieve more than these guarantee powers have achieved ever. The European Parliament plays a vital role, to be very clear. It was the European Parliament who invented the European Defense Fund. It was our initiative coming out of the uh, research budget in originally, there where we started, and uh, therefore the Parliament was the driving force uh, to achieve more cooperation inside European Union, and I think that is something which has to be strengthened um, because I re remember very well uh, the former times where the parliament itself said, no, we are a peace organization, so we are not investing in weapons. That has really changed and shifted a long time before uh, Russia invaded uh, uh, Ukraine. So therefore, I think uh, we, we delivered what we can deliver as a starting point, and, and things have developed. Uh, secondly, um, the, the, the kind of cooperation is increasing, and uh, the applying of Sweden and already being member of Finland in the NATO shows that, and even in Austria, the neutrality is one of the most important things for the existence of the state of Austria after World War II, is thinking on uh, uh, better cooperation inside European Union, not a NATO membership, but a better cooperation inside European Union. So a lot of things have moved. and. Uh, I remember quite well the NATO summit a few years ago under Donald Trump, where NATO was really at a cliff. And um, uh, I think Europe has learned its lesson, even the member state I, I know best, uh, which uh, in the 90s decided, wow, we get rid of the Red Army, only for 15 billion Deutschmark, was very cheap business uh, to get rid of them. Now we don't need any more protect ourselves. And we learn now that our trunks, which are more than 60 years old, <laughs> but technologically, the Leopard 2 is one of the decisive uh, things at the moment, but we don't have them anymore. <laughs> yeah. And we did not do any developments because we thought there will never be an attack to Germany. But now we see it directly in our neighborhood in Ukraine that attack took place uh, in, in a good old uh, style. And, um, and that is, of course, a new threat. And therefore, we have to adjust some instruments. Sorry, as we are discussing um, ESG criterions and whether uh, industry to deliver weapons is good or bad and can be financed or not according to the ESG criterions. Yeah, we have to think on that, whether that is the right approach. Um, we are discussing the question of uh, corporate sustainable due diligence. <laughs> where even a lot of raw materials we need for defense as well, not only for the uh, uh, transformation to become uh, CO2 uh, neutral, um, are under question. And, and uh, so we have to give new answers on these things as well. Otherwise, strategic autonomy makes no sense because we don't have access uh, either to, uh, neither to the production lines needed in Europe nor to the raw materials uh, which are needed uh, to achieve that. And I think, therefore, some things have to be adjusted as well. And I hope that the Parliament uh, can put some force uh, that the Commission is rethinking on these things as well. Thank you. Uh, there is indeed a connection that we haven't made so clear between all this military uh, reflection and the industrial policy one. Uh, we just have a few minutes. I don't know if someone from, the yeah, please, sir. Uh, you need a micro. Um, so, looking at strategic autonomy a little bit differently, I mean, so, um, the assumption I'm making is that Russia is done. So we're going to end up with a world in which there's United States and China on one hand and Europe in the middle. 
and whether or not Europe should think of strategic autonomy in a political sense. And by political sense, I mean Euro Europe is a cacophony. So there's no one voice coming out of Europe. But look at what happened in the United States and with Trump. A Trump, a Trump return will be a great deal worse than what it was for two years ago. So we're talking about a very, potentially a very different uh, United States. And therefore, maybe the way to think about it, Rosa said, we talk about autonomy never w without NATO in, in mind. That can continue, but politically, Europe needs to develop its own autonomous idea, both in terms of democracy, whether it's education, in all of these different things. And it, it can afford to, it can do it because it has natural um, variety and diversity within it by virtue of having all these nation states. We can't do it in the states, right? We, if Trump comes to power, the, the politics of the United States will change dramatically. And so that's, that's what you need maybe to think about. Thank you very much. One of you maybe would like to react to this, to the perspective that yeah. the next president of the US could be very different from the current one. I'm happy to say something. Please. No, I agree very much. And, uh, but that's also why I, I don't really agree with the logic of power blocks. I think, yeah. as you say, Europe is cacophonous. It's, it's diverse. It's also its strength. Uh, number one. Number two, I think it's in Europe's interest. You know, we, there's this big talk about, you know, the world uh, uh, moving towards a bifurcation of, of, of politics with the US-China rivalry. I actually think there's a lot in between. There's a lot of messy, multipolar politics going on. Um, it's messy, it's transactional, but I think that is a space where Europe as a whole can find a voice and can actually build different types of relationships, diversified relationships, notwithstanding where the, you know, the basic principles lie. Um, and that's why I mentioned the United States and I mentioned the international principles that are embodied in the United Nations. I mean, that, there's no debate as to where Europe belongs. There's no debate as to where US belongs so, at the moment. Of course, if, there's, if we're going to have a Trump II or something similar, that might change. Um, so I think that is the space where Europe can... Um, build um, its uh, international relationships, um, its uh, alignments, its partnerships. It, you know, it's more diversified, it's more multipolar. What I think it needs to do is counter this transactionalist um, way of conducting international politics. I think that has been um, partly perhaps the, one of the consequences of the Trump years. Um, that it had the, the, we've, we've seen an incentive towards transactional politics, zero-sum games, uh, play adventurism, foreign policy adventurism, um, that does not take into account the impact on the environment, or, or, you know, the broader impact. And I think the EU can be a softening uh, feature um, and could perhaps create or incentivize relationships that are not just based on zero-sum games. That, that would be a goal, in my view. Thank you very much. We are run off out of time. So thank you very much for being here and thanks a lot to thank my you. speakers. Thank you. Thanks to you. Bye.